So we're gonna talk about the neotropical migrants of the upper Texas coast today. And really, spring migration kind of, it, it kind of kicks off the last two weeks, the two weeks before this, and it's kind of just really starting to get going now. So first off, what is a neotropical migrant? So there's about 350 species of birds that, that uh, breed in North America, you know, US and Canada, and then winter in Mexico, Central America, South America, the Caribbean. And they include a lot of, uh, most of the families of birds we're used to, even a few waterfowl, but herons and egrets and raptors and shorebirds and passerines, what, the, what they call the perching birds. So that includes the warblers, the orioles, the thrushes, the tanagers, the buntings, the real colorful ones. And you can see from the map here, kind of the pathways they use. And you look at uh, right here are the dark blue lines and see how that one of those major pathways, the Mississippi and the Central Flyways kind of touch right here where we are. And uh, we have a tremendous uh, flux of birds through here. So we're gonna dive into about 100 species of birds that you might see in uh, Chambers County in the spring. We're gonna start with swallowtail kite, what a lot of people consider the most uh, photogenic of all birds. Another raptor, we get big numbers of migrating through here, Mississippi kites. This is another small raptor. They're actually very common nesters here in Chambers County. And then we're gonna move into the shorebirds, uh, Chambers County and the, and the refuger uh, the, the Anahuac Wildlife Refuge is, is designated by the Western Hemisphere Shorebird Network as a, a site of international importance because of the number of shorebirds that use the refuge. Uh, for instance, some of, one species of shorebird has been documented on a single day that 10% of the world population is present on the refuge. That's how many come through. Well, the first one's through, and you'll see them out in the short grass fields right now, is American Golden Plover. Often overlooked because it looks a lot like a killdeer is a semi-palmated sandpiper. So you'll see on some of the slides here, you'll see I have a, the conservation status listed if it's more than, if it's got some concern on it. And this is the piping plover. This is uh, actually, uh, it's listed on the Federal Register of Endangered Species. Solitary sandpiper. Uh, a few winter here, but they are just starting to come through here now. They look a lot like our common yellow legs, but you'll see that big eye ring on them. And they don't have the bright yellow legs. Upland sandpiper. This is one of the sandpipers we commonly refer to as the grass pipers. Because they, they're not really out on the sand and the mud where you think of the shorebirds are. They like the grassy fields. Wimbrels. Uh, they come through in tremendous numbers. They're just about to start. Wimbrels are the one I was talking about that they've documented 10% of the world population present on the refuge in a single day. A close relative, when it was also one of the common game birds, is the long-billed curlew. And it's a little bit bigger and has a much bigger bill. Uh, an old, old hunting name for this bird is the Texas sicklebill. The Hudsonian godwit. This is a bird that uh, comes through. It's a bit later. You'll look, if you can see the bar at the bottom, you'll see there, the peak of them is the first week of May, actually. Also, the marbled godwit. The marbled godwit's our largest shorebird in North America. Very rare in Texas, but somehow Anahuac seems to be a magnet for them as a rough. This is a European shorebird that's not well, that's not seen very often in North America. This is our fourth year in a row we've had one at Anahuac Wildlife Refuge. Stilt sandpiper, we get them coming through in numbers. They're about to start coming through in big numbers. They're big, heavy sandpiper. They often, you know, they have long, thin legs, but they often wade very far out into the deeper water where the water is almost up to their belly. Baird sandpiper, they're already uh, coming through and just about the peak. This is one of the long wing sandpipers, we call them. And the other one is the white rum sandpiper. You can see in this photo how elongated those wings are, but he has little chevron marks on the sides. That's a way, it's a way to tell those two apart. Another one of the birds we call the grass pipers, a buff-breasted sandpiper. They also have that pigeon-headed look. If you look at the head and somebody told you that was some kind of a dove, you'd believe them. The pectoral sandpiper, they're coming through in big numbers now and, and still peaking up. One thing, if you look at the pattern on the feathers on the back, you can only see two of the stripes, but there's three distinct stripes on the back. Semi-palmated sandpiper is one of our very small sandpipers. So there's, and this, I love this photo because it shows why the bird is named semi-palmated. 
So look at its feet. If you look at that back foot that's up in the air, you'll see there's webs between the toes. So if a bird has a foot like a duck and there's webs between all the toes, that's called palmated. So and this is uh, the Western sandpiper. We get tremendous numbers of these come through very similar to the semi-palmated sandpiper, one of our three smallest. But look at all those rich colors on the back. Now here's one of our two hardest to tell apart shorebirds, a short-billed dowager with the long-billed dowager. We get both of them through here. Bill looks like it was pinched a little bit at the base. If you see here how it looks like I just squeezed it in a little bit. Now we'll look at the long-billed dowager and see, look at the back. It's got a hump in the back. And you can see, look at the shape of the back. See that difference? And then look at that shape of the bill. So this is the Wilson's phalarope. They're gonna start coming in. They kind of peak about the 1st of May also. For the female is the more colorful, brighter bird than the male. Now we'll move into our passerine birds. That's what you're all waiting for anyway, the big colorful bird. <laughs> so here's one of our first ones, the yellow-billed cuckoo. So here's the black-billed cuckoo. And you can see it has a black bill. And then look at that wing. I, unfortunately, the mulberries kind of hide a little bit of the wing, but there's no rufous in that wing. It's just a brownish, grayish bird. Our first of our flycatchers, the olive-sided flycatcher. This is a near-threatened species, probably due to habitat loss, because they like to breed in wetlands. A bird that breeds in this uh, area, I know they breed up in Cedar Hill Park, I might, they might breed here at the headquarters building, uh, the eastern wood peewee. So on to the devil flycatchers, the, the impidinax flycatchers. They're, they're, they're tricky to tell apart unless you can hear them. And then here we move on to the Acadian flycatcher, which I've tried to find as a breeder in the county. They, they'll breed in, they breed in Liberty County and they breed uh, just a little bit north. I haven't found them here as the Acadian flycatcher. Alder flycatcher, one of our latest ones. One of our newest species of flycatcher. They were split from the trails flycatcher in the, in the 50s, I believe. Least flycatcher, probably our most common in Pitonax to come through here. An easier flycatcher is a great crested flycatcher. They're coming through now. I heard one out there on the trail and will go on on the field trip this morning. I didn't see it, but I did hear it over by the blind, so they're around. A bird you cannot possibly miss on the refuge starting now until October is the eastern kingbird. Everybody loves the scissor tail flycatchers. I saw my first of the year last weekend, so they're, they're showing up now and they'll become common breeders all over the county. White-eyed vireo. Very common bird breeding in this area. I could hear at least four or five singing out on the uh, trail this morning. The yellow-throated vireo, a breeder here in this area and coming through right now. Blue-headed vireo, they actually winter here, but they do migrate through here. Warbling vireo, one of our least identified vireos just because it's a, it's, it doesn't have a whole lot of marks to it. You know, it's kind of this like, well, it kind of looks like a vireo, but it doesn't have an eye line really. It doesn't have spectacles, so it often gets overlooked, but they're coming, they'll be coming through in the next couple of weeks. Philadelphia vireo. Warbling vireo is one they're likely to split into two species, the eastern warbling vireo and the western warbling vireo. The red-eyed vireo, uh, very bold looking. Maybe my personal favorite of all warblers, the black and white warbler. Uh, they're bold, they're easy to see, and it's the bird that doesn't believe gravity applies to it. <laughs> they walk around on a tree and under a tree like gravity always goes through its feet no matter which way it goes. <laughs> it just doesn't seem to care which way gravity goes. Pythonotary warbler, normally uh, I, I've been looking for them the last two weeks. They should be on territory. We just walked down the trail looking for them this morning. I couldn't find any. Uh, this is one that uh, Norm photographed here last year. Notice this weird chestnut on the head. A few birds show that. Um, actually, this might be one of the ones that there is a subspecies of yellow warbler from the tropics called a mangrove warbler that has an all chestnut head. I see it when I lead my trips to Belize, and they're, they're just a stunning warbler. Um, so I wonder if this bird might not have some mangrove warbler blood in it. But there's a lot of people that this is one of their last, the highest number birds on their life list, the Swainson's warbler. 
one of the reasons is they're an early, they're a breeder in the piney woods in East Texas, especially the wet oak palmetto uh, piney woods, and they come through very early. And so they're probably peaking in their migration now and almost done. Tennessee warbler, another one of our less, less showy warblers, often gets confused with the orange crown warbler. So here's an orange crown warbler. This one doesn't have a very light Alula, but morning warbler, another one in the same family together, has, really doesn't have much of an eye ring, and then it has a gray head and a yellow chest. Common yellow throat, breeders and residents here, but they are neotropic migrant and they do come through and you'll see them in places where you don't really expect them. Hooded warbler, so one of our, I love these things. They're just, a, I think they're a really pretty bird. American red start, I always call it the Halloween bird because it's, it's black and orange. It really would be a great Halloween bird. Cape May warbler, we don't see lots of these birds, but they do come through here. Cerulean warbler, this is one of our most endangered warblers, bright yellow bird, a bright blue bird. In fact, you'll see they sell, they sell old China patterns. They refer to it as cerulean blue. That's cerulean blue is that color. Northern Perula, already on territory in White Memorial Park and Cedar Hill Park, just singing everywhere. Magnolia warbler, very bold bird. They come through in big numbers, but late in the year. Bay-breasted warbler, another late breeder, uh, northern breeder, so it's a late one coming through here. Blackburnian warbler, the only bird that appears in the uh, minutes of a presidential cabinet meeting. <laughs> so this, the story is Teddy Roosevelt came in, he was, came in, he was walking around the White House grounds to, the, to a cabinet meeting and he announced his meeting, I just saw a black Bernie and warbler. <laughs> <laughs> so it's in the minutes of a presidential cabinet meeting. <laughs> yellow warbler, gotta like yellow warblers there, high personality bird, really pretty bright. The f even the, the females are kind of a greenish version of this, but they're still pretty bright. Chestnut-sided warbler, another of our later ones coming through. Another one of the birds is a really stunning bird, the black-throated blue. So one of the things to look for, in the winter these guys turn green, but they still have this white patch. Palm warbler, they winter here, but another group passes through in migration. They should be just peaking their migration right now. Pine warbler, breeder, you, they're singing in the parking lot out here, I noticed this morning. But they do come through as migrants too, and you'll see them in the migrant traps when you don't see them any other time there. So you see them here in the spring. Yellow rump warbler, this is a, a fine winter specimen. Uh, I should have found a breeding photo of them because they get a big, bold face. Yellow-throated warbler. This is a fresh photo. Uh, this, one, this is the one that was at the Jackson Prairie Woodlot two weeks ago at Anahuac. Prairie warbler. They probably come through in pretty good numbers through here. Very rare in this area, but there's enough records that they're worth looking for as a Townsend's warbler. This is a western breeding warbler. So this bird will, might breed in like uh, the Chisos Mountains and the Guadalupe Mountains of West Texas. Black-throated green warbler, we get lots of them through. A very, I, I love these birds. This is a kind of a weird looking warbler, the Canada warbler. They're a late migrant. The Wilson's warbler, we get some wintering ones, but they also come through in migration. Yellow-breasted chat. If you hear a noise coming out of a thicket that sounds like a bird having a seizure, <laughs> they make the wildest, weirdest noise. They sound like a mockingbird who can't get it together that day. <laughs> it's probably a yellow-breasted chat. Just... And they sing all night, I think, too. Yeah, they will. I, when we do the birding classic and we're up in East Texas at 2 o'clock in the morning, you're just hearing them. <laughs> Western tanager, not really thought of as a East Texas bird, but we sure see a couple of them every year in spring migration. Rose-breasted grosbeak, aptly named. 
Birdie dribbled his cherry juice on his chest. <laughs> blue grosbeak. Really pretty bird. It's not really blue, by the way. Blue doesn't exist in a bird color, in the feathers. That's a, it's an uh, uh, artifact of the way the light iridesces through it. Indigo bunting. I do not consider it spring till I see a bright blue indigo bunting. It's not spring yet. It isn't spring, by the way, yet. <laughs> Bobbling. They come through sporadically. Their bird is reduced in numbers dramatically because they used to be very common in the U.S. because they'll breed in hay fields. But we don't have hay fields anymore. The uh, yellow-headed blackbird. It's been a really good year. We tend to get them in... In, in the spring migration, but it's been a really good year for them. I've seen them like six or seven times this year in the county, which is uncommon. So the way you find these guys is you find the biggest flock of red-winged blackbirds you can find and look at every last one. <laughs> Orchard oriole, uh, one of our most common breeders on the refuge, and they're just arriving now. Baltimore oriole, we tend to have good days where we get lots of Baltimore orioles. And that covers a hundred neotropic migrants. Another one of Norm's fabulous photos. Any questions? I got to give special thanks to Norman Welsh and Joe Kennedy who let me use so many of their photos. Uh, you know, I could not make a pretty slideshow without contributors like that. Yeah, so a pelated woodpecker is about 12 inches in length, so that woodpecker is about that big. Oh, there he is. There, now we can make some space. There. Yeah, see, there's even a cut out there so that you could put a wheelchair right up against there. That would be your classic western cottonmouth. Right there. <laughs> so. The western cottonmouth is one of the toxic snakes in North America, but only about one person a year in the U.S. Is, it dies from a bite of one. You know, most, there are very few snake bites of, of uh, cottonmouth because people mostly leave them alone because they're out in the water and not where people are. And uh, I said there's only about one bite a year of a death from a cottonmouth bite a year. And uh, Marshall is like down like a foot from it with it. And he goes, well, how does that happen? I said, they get bit on the face by being too close. <laughs> I'm David, and this is Travis, and we're from the Friends of Anahuac Refuge, and we'd like to invite you to attend one of our turn workshops.